This is the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast, and I'm Crystal Keating. Each week, we're bringing you real conversations about disability and finding hope through hardship and sharing tangible ways that you can welcome and include people with disabilities in your church and community. If you'd like to download any of the helpful resources that have been mentioned in our conversations, please visit johnnyandfriends.org slash podcast. This month, as we celebrate Autism Awareness Month, I'm excited to be talking with a few special guests who have a very personal understanding of the impact of autism on a family. To start off, I'm speaking with Greg and Gina Hubert, a great couple who I talked with previously in February. They shared how they've kept a thriving marriage through seasons of disability. And if you missed that conversation, I highly recommend that you download the episode. Today, they're back to talk more about their family life and raising three sons with autism. Well, I am so excited to be together again as we hear more about your role as parents to Zach, Tyler, and Tate, your three sons and three young men with autism. And I had such a great time speaking with you two on our special Valentine's episode as you as you opened up about your marriage and how you both grow deeper in your love for one another amidst raising a family impacted by disability. So as we start this conversation together, can you briefly just talk about your relationship and your role as parents of three sons with autism? Well, we were high school sweethearts. We met and we dated 10 years and then we got married and we've now been married 31 and a half wonderful years. And yeah, God's blessed us with three beautiful boys with autism, Zachary, who's 27, Tyler, who's 25, and Tate, who's 22. Mm, Yeah. Well, you guys have such a sweet marriage and a hard fought relationship. And so I'm so glad to sit down with you again, because I really want to talk more about just your role as a father and a mother to your son. So after the birth of your first son, when did you start to feel a concern that something might be different about him? When did you first find out your oldest son might have autism? Well, I started noticing um, developmental issues really early because my best friends all had their little babies. We all had little kids together, but they had girls and girls seemed to develop a lot faster. Yeah. And so the girls, by the time they're a year old, they're already talking and they're doing all these things. And our cute little Zach was squirrely, was all over the place, not saying a single word um, and not not even looking like he was going to walk yet, you know, and they're all starting to run. So I started taking him to pediatricians and, and doing research and sur- surfing the net back then and um, started discovering this word called autism. Didn't know what it was, but there's certain things that started looking like it was my son. But when mm. I took him to the doctors, they were like, that's not what he is. He's fine. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, really? Okay. Which is what every mom wants to hear that oh, sure. you're fine. Yeah. So right. I try to just check that idea and um, yeah, kept moving on. Well, they kept saying, well, he's a boy. He's slower. He's developing slower than and a girl. He's fine. Don't worry about it. That was kind of the consistent input from the pediatrician, right? Right. right. Yeah. yeah. But you had that motherly instinct. Yeah, I did. And then so a a year or so later, well, we went through different medical things first, got tubes in his ears thinking maybe he couldn't hear and that's why he wasn't talking and still didn't talk after that was healed up. Mm. But we were in Hawaii at the time and I took him to a psychologist to have him tested. And once we went through that assessment, it took about an hour and a half. And um, I already had Tyler at the time. My second son was born and he was six months old. So Zach and Tyler and I were at the doctor's office. And after she did her assessment, um, I started packing up the boys and their diaper bags and everything. And she's like, okay, Mrs. Hubert, would you like to hear the results? I have my findings now. And I'm like, really? Usually people just send it in the mail. And I said, sure. Right. Well, I was like half sitting and half walking out the door because my boys are ready to go. And she's like, I think you need to sit down for this. And I said, okay. And she goes off this list and says that your son has 11 of these 18 characteristics of autism. Mm. And she went on. And after that, I couldn't hear another word Mm. Um, because I was alone. It was just me and the boys. Greg was working that day. Mm. And I remember leaving the office 
and going in the elevator and watching the elevator door shut, and it was a mirror on the other side. I had Tyler in one of those packs on my back holding Zachary, and he's just looking off in the, the corner of the elevator, and I started to cry. I didn't know what it meant, but I started to cry. That doctor said, I remember that he said Zachary was mentally retarded, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, mentally retarded? You, you know, I just didn't believe it. So I was a little angry, like he didn't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But uh, what was interesting after that is I was usually the one that kind of sided with the medical professionals because I worked in that industry. Sure. So I remember after, I don't even know if it was a day or two, but Gina mentioned, I think I'm noticing some of the similar characteristics in Tyler. Tyler's like six months old. And I was just like, no, no, you're now you're reading into it. Like... Yeah, I mean, God wouldn't do that a second time. You know, he doesn't have that kind of a sense of humor that he would give us mm -hmm. two boys with autism. Mm -hmm. But sure enough, you know, she was right. <laughs> he ended up being diagnosed with autism. It became pretty evident about when he was almost a year old, what was happening to him. It was similar to what was happening with Zachary. So now at this point, you have two sons who have been diagnosed with autism. What were your hopes for more children? Were you talking about this? <laughs> oh, yeah. We, we definitely talked about it because I think we both thought we'd have maybe four kids. We came from large families. Right. And we just thought that's what we wanted to have. And although we were looking to the Lord for guidance on it, when we had two boys with autism and the challenges of that, we actually... As we put it, we pumped the brakes, you know, in what, what we were going to do because we didn't know, really know what was ahead of us. There weren't a lot of people that understood autism. We always felt like for us, the number of children we were going to have would be dependent upon how many we could effectively disciple. Hmm. It wasn't just about a, hmm. a number, but it was like, how many children did we think we had the bandwidth for from God to actually shepherd well and disciple? So through it, after we prayed because they were born 92, 94, Tyler, and we waited a little bit. And then we had, we made a decision. Yeah, well, if we're going to have a third, we better be prepared for that child to be autistic. Mm. So we did. We had our third son and uh, Tate also was diagnosed with having mm. autism. Mm. Same kind of progression of mm. development of speech and then it deteriorated. So it was the, the exact same patterns. We knew like, this is where we go, Lord, mm. I think, I think this is it. Mm -hmm. Like you want us to have three boys with mm -hmm. autism, with a disability. Mm -hmm. And that, that really hit us again. It was the third, you think after two times, it wouldn't punch in the gut. But the third time it was like, every time we would get the letter with the official diagnosis, we'd both break down and cry. Well, as you both embrace the diagnosis for three of your sons, what were some of the fears that you had or questions you began asking yourself, asking the Lord about your lives, about your future, about the future of your children, all of that. What were some of those initial things that were welling up in your heart? Well, between the two of us, Gina's like, she's like the COO of the house. Like she, she's the chief operating operator. She does, she keeps the, the machine well-oiled. And I'm like the one that's always, the CEO is looking way out. And so for me, I probably had more of the, the longer term, like right after they are born, I'm thinking, are they going to be able to play baseball as a big sports guy? I love playing baseball. What's that going to be like? Are, are they going to be able to go to college? Are they not going to get married? Are we not going to have grandkids? I mean, I took it so far as like, what happens when they die, you know, and we're not here. Yeah. So all these things of what we thought would happen mm -hmm. with our kids of, of what, what you kind of get married and think, you know, with different variations, but your kids are going to grow up and experience all these things. It's like, what does that look like? We had no idea. And we didn't know anybody we could turn to to even have those conversations because we didn't know anybody else that had kids with autism. Mm -hmm. We would go to support groups and they were so sad. Everyone Awful. had no hope. Oh, really? Yeah. It's we depressing. were like, oh, this is not giving us any answers. There were autism support groups for families? There were autism complaint groups. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, that's my... That's my that's, it, that was your experience. Yeah. Every time we, we'd go two or three times, it was just the same 
sharing their frustrations and there was just no, there was no hope. Mm -hmm. Just getting us really hardened and negative about Mm -hmm. it. Why? Like Mm -hmm. these kids were some kind of a burden and a curse to us. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. what's, what's the the silver lining in these Mm -hmm. kids' lives for us? What, why has God put them in our lives? Right. Not just one with two neurotypical kids. It was like all three, right. All three of them couldn't talk like for the longest time. Right. So. No, that's so hard because in the moments where we're feeling hopeless, we really need life giving words from the church, from our friends, people who can be that strength for us when we're feeling extremely weak and we feel like the bottom's been pulled out under us, even when we know God is there. Gina, what was it like for you to embrace your role as a mother? I took that role as a mom because that's all I wanted to do is be a mom. So putting aside the fact that they're autistic, God gave me three beautiful boys. They're different from all the other little boys I knew. But I thought it's my job to find out who they are, to find out what they like, how can I communicate to them, how can I let them know how much I love them. So I became this student of my children. I became a detective because I had to figure things out a lot and all the time. Then God blessed me because I got to see how funny my kids were. (laughs) You know, Zachary, when he couldn't talk and I'd say, go clean up your room, I'd walk in and it was immaculate. He understood you. He understood. But to the degree, this is the autism part. Like his books were lined up by size you know, ascending in order. His shoes were stacked by color. All the blue shoes were together and the white shoes were together. The sandals were together. His bed was made. His toys were all lined up. All the bears were next to each other. The cars were next to each other. And I thought, this is better than anything, you know? (laughs) And I just thought it was the greatest thing. And God helped me celebrate those things. Only God could create that, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I didn't teach him to do that. God instilled that within him. Mm -hmm. And then I prayed with them. Well, I actually prayed that Zach could talk because he couldn't talk. And then one day when he started, I was thinking, do you remember when we prayed he could talk? (laughs) (laughs) Now he won't stop. Now he won't stop. (laughs) But, and I wanted him to talk so that he could learn language, so he could read God's word. When he was five years old, we we walked into his class and he said, Hick, I want Hick. And I go, Hick, what's Hick? And it was a little carton box of high C juice. H I C. Hick, <laughs> this child can read. And I thought, mm, another blessing, Lord. you know? And so Zachary today can read the word. And it's so exciting. God. So that's all God. And so I was able to, in those crazy moments, look at what looked like a disaster mm-hmm. and be able to turn it into a blessing. And that's only from the Lord. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a mom so bad. Um, I wasn't specific (laughs) in my order, but he knew what was better. And so I learned to just love that. Mm, That's beautiful. How has it been raising your children through times of like play dates and community outings with other moms and times where you're with more quote neurotypical children? What's been the... What's been your experience as a mother in those circumstances? It's been hard and ugly, (laughs) but I had to try. I was a, I was a person that was going to try everything. So I did the mommy and me classes and I took, I remember taking Tyler to a mommy and me, like a gymboree kind of class. Right. So we brought our own little mat and all the little babies or toddlers are sitting on their mom's laps and in the blankets and mine's climbing the chairs and the tables and everywhere else in the sandbox and everyone's getting annoyed. And I'm sweating trying to pull my child in. Right. But I thought, Lord, I'm going to try this. Yeah. And it was awful. <laughs> I just have to say it was awful. But I was thankful that I at least tried. Yeah. You know? Um, right. So that's what it was like, you know, and then worrying about what every other mom was thinking. Mm-hmm. And as they got older, I remember hearing a mom say, don't play near that kid because mm. he's a brat. And I just was crushed. Mm. I was crushed. Mm. Praise God that my kids were so oblivious to all those comments. Mm. They were not hurt at all by that. Mm. I was. Mm-hmm. But um, God was just good. He helped me realize, you know, these people don't know him, so they don't know my children. Mm-hmm. And I'd have to 
just really pray over that. Yeah, I think we we talked about we we say we have to have thick skin but soft hearts because a lot of parents with with children with disabilities develop hard hearts in the process as well, mm-hmm. where they're really resentful for the kids they've been given. And that mm-hmm. continues to grow the older the children get because when they're small, they're cute. When they get bigger, they get kind of scary looking mm-hmm. from the behaviors they have. Mm-hmm. And that even applies in the church that mm-hmm. if you have a big six foot four kid that's going and wants to touch a pregnant woman's belly, you know, that's creepy, right? And, and it's, it, it, it gets different. It gets hard. And, right. and we constantly, even to this day, when we, we take our kids out, we get stares, we get looks, we get comments. And it's so much of us having, trying to have God's lens of how he sees our kids. Yes, that's and so really, good. And really, really, and many, many times ignore people. But sometimes I say things, you know, I just say, what are you looking at? And then they stop and they, they don't know what they're doing. But we try to say people really don't understand. They've not been exposed to this for the fact mm-hmm. we get those comments and those looks, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Papa Bear comes out, right, to get protective. You haven't seen Mama Bear. <laughs> Mama Bear is tougher than Papa Bear. <laughs> oh, well, and God put that in you yeah. for that reason. You know, I'm really interested in hearing about your son's spiritual sensitivity. How do they display an interest in God? I mean, you said that your son reads the Bible What's that been like for you through the years? One thing I've noticed, particularly with our two boys that are nonverbal, our two younger boys, is I've, I've observed this with Gina a lot, where we'll hear one of our boys just all of a sudden having a meltdown or crying for no reason, like uncontrollable crying. It could be they've watched a video that's triggered a memory. Hmm. And what I, I would be the one that would say, what do we do? And, and Gina would just go back she'd come out and they'd be, they'd stop. And I'd say, what did you do? And she was, I just laid next to them or I just sat in the room next to them and prayed. I prayed out loud mm. and, um, they would just quiet down. I can't explain. It was just God calming because we couldn't through any kind of words. We couldn't say it's going to be okay. But mm. the fact that we would just, she would just pray with them. I learned from her how to disciple my boys in that regard because they couldn't tell us what was hurting. They couldn't Mm -hmm. tell us what they were afraid of, Mm -hmm. but we could just pray with them and God would work in their hearts to calm them down. And I saw it time and time again, even to this day, she'll do that. And they're very sensitive. When we pray, they just get quiet. They'll just know. And I'll look at them sometimes. There's just a sensitivity in all three of our boys, a spiritual sensitivity maybe because we've done it all their lives, maybe because we, when they wanted to have routine in their autism, Mm -hmm. what Gina did real well, we moved so much, she would break up their routine to force them to adapt to different situations or we have to go now, we can't wait 10 more minutes. Hmm. Uh, She was really good at stretching our kids to learn how to adjust to chaos and find um, comfort so much of it was praying for our kids. And I think they've developed these soft, sensitive hearts because of that, over praying for them for 20 plus years. I think we just tried to live out our salvation in front of our kids, knowing that God is going to speak to their hearts, right? So we would do that. We would live it out and we would pray with them. We, Whatever we were learning at church or small group, we'd share it out loud and and we would say it to Tate. Tate, this is what God taught me today. And he could be just walking around, but only God knows what's getting in his heart. Amen. Right? And so when they finally are in that place where they're in despair and we say, can I pray for you? They stop. And that's a, that's a way of communicating to me that they understand. They're like, I'm going to stop crying because you're just going to pray for me right now. Let's mm. go. And I'm thinking, mm. I'm getting the communication through his eyes, mm. his touch. So I know that my kids... I know they have a relationship with the Lord. Mm-hmm. I could see it in their eyes when I talk. They look back at me or I'm like, can I pray for you? And then they grab my hands and fold them. And I'm like, he just said yes. <laughs> so don't tell me my kids don't know Jesus because mm-hmm. they do. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that just shows a confidence. Your confidence that as you're praying, the Holy Spirit is working in ways that 
you can visibly see in a small way, but in a great way in their heart that transcends the limitations that their bodies have. Right. So praise God for his Holy Spirit who speaks the language of your children, right? So, well, you know, talk about your experiences in churches. I know you guys moved around quite a bit. Greg, your intention was to go into full-time ministry. You are seminary trained, but it seemed God had other plans for you through the years. So what's it been like as you've gone from church community to church community? It's been a challenge because it wasn't something, (laughs) all these moves wasn't something we planned to do. I think as we did that each time, our commitment was to go find a church. Mm. It was exhausting because every time we would go, Mm. I would spend time on the phone calling and inquiring. Gina would look on the website, get a sense of their theology, then say, maybe these ones look good. I would call the pastor. Inevitably, they would all say, yeah, we'll give it a try. They didn't have a disabilities ministry generally, but they'd say, we're glad to welcome your family. Every pastor would say that. But then... I would go visit. She'd stay home with the boys. I'd come back and say, I think it's okay. She would go scout it out. I'd stay home with the boys. And she goes, no, this one's not going to work out. Mm -hmm. So it was this back and forth of, of scouting out churches. And then when we would eventually get one, we'd go and then they would say, okay, Greg and Gina, what do we need to do now? Like we're just gauging the heart of, of the leadership of would they have us come there? But ultimately we ended up creating disabilities ministries at these churches because we wanted to have a place for our kids. That was the whole reason. We had right. to start start the shadow program to watch the, the, our boys so we could go to church instead of... A shadow program, like a buddy program? Like a buddy program, exactly. So so that you and Gina could go to church together. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because one would go and the other would stay at home with the kids yeah. and it didn't work. And so that's what we did. And it was about an 18 month, right? Three year process to get it to where we could. That's a long time. Get things and, and participate in the ministries and have enough people that wanted to be around our kids and watch them. Mm-hmm. That's it an would investment. Take. It's a big investment. And whenever we'd move to a new location, <laughs> we would say, okay, we got to start the process again. It was, it was exhausting because we knew yeah. there wasn't going to be a plug and play church to go to everywhere we went and we scouted out. Yeah. We had to go start it again and we go, are you ready? Are you ready, babe, to do this? Not yet. Okay. Now I'm ready. And then we would go and we would pray up and do the heavy lifting and start doing the things we needed to do to have a place for our kids. And it was, it was hard. It was really it hard. It was hard, but my my sweet girlfriends were my prayer warriors and they would always say... Everybody needs some prayer yeah. warriors mm-hmm. in their lives, that's for and sure. they would always say, Gina, you and Greg are these pioneers. And I'm like, no, we're not. Yes, you are. You guys are mountain blasters. You're going to go into this new <laughs> state and start all over again. Mm-hmm. So with the support of all these loving people mm-hmm. praying for us, um, it would take us six months before we were ready to do it every time we moved because we knew the commitment. Mm-hmm. You know, so, mm-hmm. but when we were ready, it's like, Lord, okay, bring us to the right church, mm-hmm. have the right people and another church and we get another ministry started and then we can back off and another year we move and it's time to go do it all over again. Mm-hmm. So we do that several times. What are some of your big takeaways as you've pioneered ministering to other families affected by disability in certain places? I mean, you have to reap the benefits of wisdom and discernment, especially now that you're really trying to impact churches to catch that vision of welcoming families, one family at a time, right? Right. It really is. I don't think we were ever caught up. It always started with just taking care of our own family, have a Mm -hmm. place for them to help the church understand what God's view is First Corinthians 12, that these are the weaker parts of the body that are indispensable to the church and not, not shoving it down the leadership's throat, but coming alongside them and helping them understand this is what God's designed them to do. And we went to churches where I remember when we went to one, one city that we got involved with a church that actually had a remnant of a disabilities ministry. And when we got there, and we got involved, we had the first leadership meeting and we said, Gina said, we're, we're going to get involved. 
So we went to the leadership meeting. They came to our house, I remember, right? Mm -hmm. And they all came and we said, yeah, we're going to be a part of it. We had the meeting. And then at the end of the meeting, 90% of the group quit. They said, well, this is my last, my last meeting. This no is my way. last meeting. They just all bailed on us. And one other family stayed with us. And I said, are you guys going to stay or leave? And they go, oh no, we're with you. But we come to find out that the reason everything was falling apart is because the, the families had got become so combative with, with the church leaders. Mm -hmm. Like they were saying, you owe us this. Mm. You are supposed to do this. Mm. And the church leaders actually came to us probably a year or so later and said, we were shutting this thing down because we couldn't do anything right. Like everything mm. we did wasn't enough. You felt totally defeated. Defeated. And, and the families felt like we're not getting what we want. Sure. And we took a different approach where we just, number one, prayed about how we would be involved. And we tried to help the church leaders understand how God looked at this community of people with disabilities. So I would go in and talk to the pastors and help them understand and come alongside them. Gina then, once we got the okay, she'd be like the OT person in the classroom. She'd do the trainings for all the teachers. So she knew all the practical stuff. She was doing the in-services and the trainings and and going in the classroom, observing and helping the buddies, mm -hmm. you know, work with the different kids. And we kind of back and forth with each other. But I think it was, to go back to your question, what we learned is that every church really wants to help. I don't think we ran into anybody who ever said, no, you're not welcome here. But it was really a, a lack of understanding of what mm -hmm. that meant. It's a, it's a big commitment on the part of the church to help one family. And their fear is, if we help one there's going to be a busload of them come in the next week and we don't have anywhere to put them. And you have to kind of ease. I would always say God does it one family at a time. He's not going to bring more families in here than you can handle. Mm -hmm. and, it, and everywhere we've gone, it's one family mm -hmm. maybe in a year or so. And then he brings another family through that invitation and then another. And it just, he brings them in when the church is ready and has the support structure and, and the heart to take on more. And that's where our church is at right now is that we just had a new family come in Sunday and they just saw us on a website and said, well, how'd you learn about us? Well, it's the only church we found in this general area that has a real disabilities ministry. And we greeted them and they said, our son has autism. And we were so excited. We, we said, screamed. congratulations, that's the best <laughs> thing. And they were like, actually they jumped back? Like, what do you mean this is exciting? <laughs> oh, they're gonna, you're going to love it here because we have 21 other families that have kids with disabilities, mm. mostly autism. At your church, you have yeah. 21 families? Wow. And we were just like, this is amazing. So like, welcome to the community. Yeah. Welcome to yeah. the family. Welcome to the body of Christ. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, what are we going to do with that? It was like, <laughs> we're excited and they, they don't get that even from the church, because yeah. it's more of a fear, like, what do we do now? Yeah, so. no, that's huge. Well, you guys have probably seen God's hand move in significant ways through the years, along with many of the faith questions that you have encountered. Can you talk about some significant points in your relationship, in your family life, where you just know this was God, he did this? There was one time when we were unemployed and we started, we decided to do our own nonprofit. And it was to provide family camps for families affected by autism. What? <laughs> yeah. We did this 15 years ago, right? Yeah. How interesting. So that was because it was based on an experience we had had. We had gone on vacation and it was horrific. It just didn't work. We went to Hawaii. We're up in a hotel on the 11th floor. Our kids like heights. We want to jump off the balcony. All, you know, oh, man. Just, it wasn't the right place. So the engineer of the hotel came in and said, well, here's some saran wrap. You can lock your sliding doors from the lanai. Oh, and this furniture goodness. is made of iron. At nighttime, push it up against the door. And we're like, okay, we still are not going to be able to sleep. You know, so it was an awful vacation. The kids had fun during the day. Awful in Hawaii, <laughs> you right? You really can't <laughs> rest. Yeah, you're in this yeah. beautiful place. <laughs> that kind of triggered it. It's like, what can we do for families like ours right. to have a vacation, a real vacation where the parents can have rest, but your family's still there. We can do respite separate from our kids, but what can we do together and still make it a family vacation. Mm -hmm. So that was when we decided to do this family retreat. And it worked out for the first year while Greg was unemployed. But then Greg got a job. And so we had to move on. And then this church that we were attending at the time decided they were going to take it over. And they did. And they've grown it. And they changed the name so they can own it. 
Now it's 16 years later. They're still wow. doing it. They're still doing it. So that's a God thing, right? In yes, spite especially of we were- for families specifically impacted by autism. Another one, Crystal, that I just thought about was when we were in our church plant, just just to see what God was able to do in some of these churches. It was a family that was on the verge of divorce. Their oldest ha- had autism. And then two other younger uh, siblings, neurotypical. And this family, just by inviting them to church, the husband wasn't a Christian, the mom was a Christian. And we just did one of those, hey, well, watch your son, bring him. And at the time it was a church plant. We didn't have a room. We just met on the playground. So I just said, I'll, I'll buddy with, with your son and just hung out. And they went to church together. And the husband came to know Christ through being able to go to church together. And Praise then they the didn't get a divorce because they started to see. And the, the two younger siblings were just resentful because everything focused on their, yeah. their sibling with disability. And I remember um, not long ago, so all the family came to Christ but I remember we went Thanks to a, a shoe, a, this was about three years ago, we went to a shoe store and the daughter was working there and she came up to Gina, I remember, and hugging her and thanking us for restoring her family. It was God, right? Mm. But she said, we, I used to resent my brother. Mm. My parents, you know, were, at, they were they were on a verge of divorce, but thank you for loving our family mm. and bringing us into a church. And they still go to that church. Like we, we got moved around but they still go to that church and, and, the, still and they the run ministry. the disabilities ministry and they oversee and are like board members of that camp. That's where that camp started. So it's just really cool to see how God changed families because, you know, we just were willing to, to let God use us. And yes. there's probably hundreds of stories like that. We don't even know about until we get to heaven. Right. But God gives us a, like a window into those, it gives us insight and say, look at what, by your willingness to do this, look what I did in this family. And it just makes us want to reach other families faster, you know, with the days we have left on this earth. Love God, love people, especially those with God-designed abilities, right? Yeah, it is amazing to see what God can do with your yes when you just step in and you're willing. Um, And I think we can get overwhelmed saying like, well, I don't know what to do with all these like ethereal families that may come into our lives and really who has God put in your path? and to embrace that and to ask God for wisdom. So how encouraging. Well, you know, as we're talking about church and talking about just the importance of community, would you please share some encouragement to the churches who may have various families impacted by disability and specifically autism in their congregation? And they may be feeling unsure about how to face the various challenges this diagnosis brings. Everybody's at a a different season of their life with disabilities. And I think particularly at the front end when they're diagnosed, I think there's um, a lot of emotions that they don't even know how to to deal with. And so it it really depends, number one, if they're the only family at their church and they've just discovered it, that can can really feel like they're on an island because Mm -hmm. unless anybody else has an experience with it, they need to reach out. I think that's where... uh, organization like Johnny and Friends to be able to reach out and how we're networked with a variety across the United States church networks of, of churches that do have disabilities ministries. We Now with technology, they can be connected over the phone, over email, over text, and that they don't have to feel isolated even if their church isn't that way. And depending on where they're at, you know, how devastated they are, they may not to take them away from that church, but they need to, to, for a season, go to a place where they're getting the support, or they may be completely surrounded by their own church who wants to do that, but they don't know what to do. Johnny and friends can provide resources for them to come alongside them and help them understand what autism is, how this fits into the church. We have um, people and resources that can come alongside them and help their church know how to best minister and serve that family with disabilities. Absolutely. Yeah. We, Johnny and friends, we're here to equip churches who are listening today who say, I know that family and I feel overwhelmed and I'm not sure what to do. We have plenty of resources to help your church leadership. And if you're that family that's listening and you're feeling discouraged, and isolated, misunderstood, there's resources of encouragement for you as well. So I I appreciate you talking about just those different stages 
of, you know, from square one, the diagnosis to you have the teenager and, you know, bodies are changing and minds are changing. How do we, how do we embrace this family still? So that's really good. Well, how can we in the church change our attitude and perspective about autism we think disabled families need all the help, but really it's the church that needs us. And in, and when you step out and you serve and you're that one that says yes, you will see how blessed you will be and think, I can't imagine what it was like not having families mm-hmm. like this in our church before. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember this last little girl, she had never had been invited to a birthday party. And there was another gal in our church who has two daughters that are neurotypical and said, let's have a birthday party for this little gal. And this little gal has autism. She has no friends. And so the other gal said, well, we'll invite our friends. So we had this great, big, beautiful birthday party, invited all these kids the same age, and it was all about her. And she had all these friends, a great birthday party, and the these young gals, these, you know, 12 and 13 year old girls were so excited that they got to serve and love this little gal with autism that they thought, Mm. how come we don't do this all the time? Mm. And so I just thought that's what it's like when Mm. children can see they have an opportunity to serve and get blessed. Mm. And we've done this over a long enough period of time over the years, even young families, when they're starting to have children, those parents don't necessarily have the bandwidth with their own families to like volunteer and help. Yeah. You get a little bit older, you don't maybe have the energy and to run around on the floor with a, a, a little child with autism. But we, we found in our experience that there's kind of this high school, young college age, you know, constituent of kids going to church that they're so at a college age, they're so eager to learn. And we get yeah. a couple of them involved with the ministry and they just kind of run with it. And they, and we've seen these kids then get married and have children, and they're still involved with the disabilities mm-hmm. ministry because what they'll say, the, the whole concept in 1 Corinthians 12 about them being indispensable, when you think about it, the church in that passage that Paul's describing, they're not fully the church without them, with mm-hmm. those weaker part, parts of the body. And so when we see that, that individuals and adults with disabilities come into the church, we hear all the time that they'll say, well, thank people for watching our kids. And they'll say, I am more blessed than your kids. I I learned more about Jesus today just by watching your child than what I learned in some other setting. And we hear that time and time again, that somehow God through a nonverbal child's life, some in some way, God through that parent suffering or disability, mm-hmm. God is magnified in a way mm-hmm. that he, he just is not resonating with certain people who would not see it through a neurotypical message, interaction. Somehow God melts that heart of that person through our kids right. without them ever, ever saying anything. And until you've seen it, you just, it, it's, it's amazing to watch. Like when we connect the church with these families, they're guaranteed to have more joy, the greater suffering, but, but greater joy in Christ. And then they'll see him and people say, why are you so, I don't get it. Why are you happy about having these kids? And we go, ta-da, tell them about Jesus, right? <laughs> tell them about Jesus. It's just like, there's no better platform to let, you know, through the weakness of our children, see the strength and the power of Jesus Christ in their lives. So... So, you know, when you think about your future, what are some of the ways you've already planned for the well-being of your your boys? So I'll tell you when it really hit me, Crystal, is when I was working, I would call on physicians and sell them medical devices. And I remember sitting in the doctor's waiting room one day. I remember seeing the door open and an elderly woman who had to be in her late 70s. And I see this wheelchair come in and I see this late 50s-year-old man with a disability uh, I think he had Down syndrome, but she's wheeling him into the doctors. And it just hit me like she's still caring for her son in his late 50s. She didn't look too strong and too able, and she's yeah. wheeling him into the office. And I realized what a, for us, what a disservice it would be to our children not to prepare well because we could die at any moment. 
And then where do our kids go? They become wards of the state. If we didn't prepare a will and we didn't do a, a, uh, a living trust with a special needs trust and all the things that come along that we had to learn about, but our kids could just end up with anybody and we would have no say in the direction of their care or anything like that. So for us in planning this, you know, we had to sit down and we had to talk to people who understood kind of end of care kind of life situations mm -hmm. and seek out counsel. And so we did, we've prepared not only a, will, a living trust, but a special needs trust. And it, it hasn't been something that was a, a, a one week thing. This, it, it was kind of years in preparation to know what the timing was. And for us, and we're seeing this more now is when parents are caring for their kids, they say, no one can do it better than us. Right. We're not always going to be here. We'll go home to be with the Lord. And we want to make sure they're in a, a place that's going to care and love them and have the things that we think are best in their best interest as they're growing older. And it's not cookie cutter. It's not like one size fits all because our middle boy, Tyler, he was having real aggression issues when he was 17 where he's hitting the walls and he, he was almost 400 pounds. He had eating problem where he would eat out of the trash cans. We had to lock the refrigerators at night and he was getting a little scary to us. Like he was so strong for me to, to restrain him was, you know, me being 220 and him almost 400. I mean, do the math. <laughs> and so what we were, we, he was kind of telling us that something had to change. And so we were praying like, Lord, what do we do? And we had him on emergency lists with regional services. Mm -hmm. And then we ended up in California and we had someone all out of the blue say, hey, we got an opening in one of our homes, but we need to know in two weeks if he can move in. So they came and interviewed Tyler. They liked him. We went and saw the home. And then the big question was, well, Tyler can't talk. How do we know if he's going to like this? And he was miserable at home. And when we took him to visit that home, remember, Mm -hmm. He just got calm in the house. He just like smiled. We take him home wow. and he was agitated again. So we just said, I think this might be the right time, Lord. And sure enough, I remember we still have a picture of him mm -hmm. where we took him the first day in his home. And then, and he just had the biggest grin on his face. Like he wasn't crying when we left. He was like, almost like nonverbally, thanks See mom and dad. <laughs> See you. And we cried for a week because this now kind of became his new family. Like if, if God took us home that next day, this would be his new family. And that's the hard part of it. But we've been going through that with our youngest Tate. He's 22 now. Tyler had been in a group home since he was 18 and we've been praying for the right time. And we thought we had another group home just like six months ago for him. And we thought we were praying for the same thing. And we, we would go to that home and take him in and he wouldn't get out of the car. We would talk him through it. Hey, this is the home we're thinking. Let us know what you think. Yeah. And the closer we got to that date, the more he withdrew and more he kind of pulled back. So yeah. we haven't placed him in a group home yet because he's give, giving some sense that he's not ready for it. So it's not a, a simple way of figuring it out, but we ask for God to give us direction through them, through other people, uh, what the people are like in the homes, right? And So we'll try again and see what happens the next time. Right. And, and pray over it again and see if he's ready at that point. Gina and Greg, it's been so sweet to have you on the podcast again. And thank you for your time. You guys are a blessing. Thanks, Crystal. Yeah, thanks, Crystal. What an inspiring conversation with Greg and Gina. I loved hearing about the uniqueness of Zach, Tyler, and Tate, and how Greg and Gina have embraced their roles as parents and also as leaders when it comes to helping churches see that all members of the body of Christ are indispensable. If you've been inspired by our conversation, would you please give our podcast a five-star rating on your favorite app? You can also drop me a message at podcast at johnnyandfriends.org. I would love to hear from you. And to get our next conversation automatically, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Crystal Keating, and thank you for listening to the Johnny and Friends Ministry Podcast. <laughs>